Oh, brilliant. Thank you, Dan. Um, that, that's just gorgeous. I'd never thought of myself in that way. I mean, to be fair, all I really think I do is I just share some stuff that I think God is telling me and that I think is just good common sense. So if it makes a difference in people's life, well, that just brings joy to my heart. That's the air that I breathe. Uh, it is so good to be here with you today. I mean, have you guys been having fun? Ah, now there's volume. You see, the other two venues, Christchurch and Wellington, they were mostly excited about being at Promise Keepers, but you guys, I mean, you've bought the T-shirt, you have this in your DNA, you love what it's about. Is that right? Yeah. That's great. So as Dan mentioned, my name's Richard. I head up an organization called Strength to Strength, which is a counseling and training organization. I mean, that's, that's the face that we present to the world. But, but our heartbeat, the reason behind all that we do is we want to see people succeed with life. Succeed with this life that Jesus said he came to bring us, but a life that many people haven't found easy and certainly not abundant. So I lead a team of people. We counsel, we coach, we supervise, we train all with the purpose of helping them to break through and break free into all that they have been created to be and to do all that they have been called to do. And I've got to say, I love what I do. And really this morning, what I want to do is just draw upon some of what we do to look at how do we grow stronger in ourselves that we might live far more courageously for our God. Does that sound okay? Yeah, you're not so convinced now, are you? I've lost the people at the back. So to do this, what I want to share with you is one key aspect that I work with pretty much all of my clients on in order to bring the change that needs to come in their life and to release what God wants to do in their life. But it's an area that at times can seem seemingly insignificant, but it carries such powerful ramifications. And that is simply your perspective. Do you see that your perspective can either help you or it can hinder you? Your perspective can restrain what God is doing in your life or it can set you free. Your perspective is that powerful. And I want to take you to a passage of Scripture where we hear perspective spoken. We hear three distinct perspectives shared by three different groups. So if you've got your Bibles with you, we're going to go to Exodus chapter 14, starting at verse 10. Now, now, just a bit of background to this passage. This is the point in Israel's history where they have finally been set free from Egypt. They are wandering out of Egypt into the desert. Their men, their women, their children, their livestock, their livelihood, they're all wandering out, setting themselves free from Egypt until they get to the banks of the Red Sea. And as they camp on the banks of the Red Sea, just trying to work out, how do we navigate this body of water? They look over their shoulder, and what do they see coming, bearing down on them? But Pharaoh and his army. Pharaoh has changed his mind. And he's coming back to either enslave them or slaughter them. Either way, it doesn't look good. And my friends, when you feel like you are stuck in such a difficult place, when you feel like you're up against a hard place and a rock, when you feel like you're up against the devil and the deep blue sea, when you feel like you're so stuck that there is no way forward, there looks like there are no options, there's nothing that you can do, when you feel so stuck that you feel powerless and everything feels hopeless, there is only one thing left to do. Whinge. Whinge, complain, fuss. And that's what we see the Israelites doing. So let's go and have a look at this passage. So what we read here, starting at verse 10. 
As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and they cried out to the Lord. Now, I think this is one of the funniest passage in the Old Testament. And they said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out here in the desert to die? I mean, what have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in this desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. You see, my friends, in this passage, when they are facing this really difficult situation, we hear three distinct perspectives shared by three groups of people. The Israelites speak, then Moses speaks, and then God speaks each sharing a different perspective. So first up, we have the Israelites, and they speak. Now, they speak from a powerless perspective. And to be fair, we can understand why. Because this was a group of people who had been enslaved in Egypt for how long? Almost 500 years. For 500 years, they have been enslaved. They have been abused. They have been tortured and tormented. They have seen their children slaughtered before their eyes. They have been dominated and controlled. They have been restrained. And it's from this experience that they now see Pharaoh's army coming towards them. And they speak from that perspective. You see, they have come up out of Egypt, but they are speaking as if they were still in Egypt. The slavery, they've come up out of slavery, but the slavery has yet to come out of them. Can you see that? And you see, because of what they've experienced in the past, that is now shaping their perspective in the present. And they whinge, complain, and fuss. And you see, my friends, as I sit with my clients, what I'll often find is that they are reacting to, they are facing their present situation based on what they've experienced in the past. They have been conditioned by their experiences of the past that it now shapes how they see the world themselves and their God. They have been shaped by what they've, been, what they've experienced from, from the neglect, from the abuse, from the tragedy, from the trauma, from their regret. And what they'll say to me is, Richard, from all that I have come through, from all that I have experienced, today, I walk with a limp. Today, I walk with shame. Today, I walk with regret. I walk with the pain of the past, of all that has been. And what I'll say to them, what I'll share with them is, sure, what has happened has happened, but this does not define who you are. You see, what you may have done and what you may have even failed to do may have come from you, but it is never the essence of you. 
You have a God who through Jesus has forgiven you everything and cleansed you of all unrighteousness. But I'll have people who'll say, Richard, I know. I know that I'm forgiven. I know that I'm cleansed. But when I look at what I've done or what I failed to do, where I am, what do I see of me? I'm weak. I'm insufficient. I'm inadequate. When I look at all that I have done and failed to do, what do I know of me? I am a failure. I am powerless. So in all of this, I am disqualified. I'll have people who will say, you know, I I know that I'm forgiven. I know that I'm cleansed. But you've got to understand, Richard, I can't change the past. I'm the one who had the affair. And it almost cost me my marriage and my family. So I cannot put these bags down because I cannot undo what I have done. And one of the things I'll say to them is tell me, what do you know now today? that you didn't know back then? Oh, they'll say, quite a bit. And they'll list off all that they have learned or all that they now understand. And I'll say, so if I took this present version of you that knows these things, and I put you back in that past situation, tell me, what would be different? To which they'll say, oh man, if only... If only that could happen. I wish I could do that. I would change all that had happened. And I'll say, and if I took this present version of you that knows something different, and and I put you in the future where you face a similar situation, tell me what will be different in the future? And they'll say, oh, everything. Everything would be different with what I know now, with what I have learned. And I'll say to them, did it ever occur to you that you can put down these bags? Because this is no longer you. You see, when you know something different, you become someone different. And so you can leave these bags behind because this isn't who you are. This is who you were. And you see, when you know that you have a God who has forgiven you everything in Jesus and cleansed you of all unrighteousness, when you know something different than what you knew in the past, you have become someone different. And I'll say to them, as you hear that, just tell me, what changes inside for you? And they'll say, wow, I realize I don't have to carry these bags anymore because these bags belong to an old version of me. These bags belong to a Jesus who died in my place. I can set these bags down and walk free because this is no longer me. And you see, my friends, if we're going to live courageously for our God, we have to bring closure to our past so that it no longer pursues us. And that's what we see God is about to do with the Israelites. He's about to bring closure to their past so that it no longer pursues them. You see, what they are failing to remember is that they are sons and daughters of Abraham. What they are failing to remember is that they are sons and daughters of the Most High God. What do they see of themselves? Is that we are slaves. We are powerless. So there is no option for us but to whinge, complain, and fuss. So that's the powerless perspective that we can so easily get caught in. But now in our passage, now we hear Moses speak. And Moses is a man of faith. I mean, Moses is a man who has experienced the power of God at first hand. He has seen God deliver these miracles. So Moses speaks from a faith perspective. And he says to the Israelites, do not be afraid. Stand firm. Be still. Do not be afraid. 
do you realize that fear is a powerful form of faith? I mean, when you think about it, what are you doing when you fear? You have a strong conviction that something that hasn't happened will happen. It's just that it's the worst case scenario. Whereas what our God talks to us about is a faith of hope, where we have a strong conviction that something that hasn't happened will happen, and it's God's best. And so he says to us throughout Scripture, do not be afraid. Cast your cares, your anxiety onto him, because that kind of fear quenches the faith that God wants us to have. So do not be afraid, he says, stand firm. Now, if you were the Israelites, it would be fair enough to say, um, Moses, exactly how do we stand firm? I mean, we're up against the Red Sea. We've got Pharaoh bearing down on us. Moses, we've got to say the facts, they don't look good. And when you're up against it and you're facing things where the facts don't look good, how do we stand firm? Well, we see this answered in Psalm 121 where the psalmist says, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Now, I don't know about you, but I often hear this passage misquoted. And for those of you who love syntax and grammar, it's the difference between a statement and a question. You know, oftentimes I'll hear people quote this as if it's a statement. And what they're saying is, I lift my eyes to the mountains. That's where my help comes from. And it always made me wonder, what is it about mountains that they're so helpful? And is it a specific mountain or will any do? And also, what constitutes a mountain? I mean, if I put a mound of soil in my backyard, is that sufficient from which I can draw some help? But of course, it's not a statement. It's a question. The psalmist is saying, when I look up at the mountains, I've got to ask, where does my help come from? And you would be fair enough to ask, What is it about mountains that they're so scary that we need help? You see, back in that day, up along the mountain ridge, that's where they put their idols. That's where they put their statues to Baal. That's where they put their asher poles. And so when the psalmist is going out into the town and he's looking up and he sees these idols surrounding him, surrounding his people, when he sees that, that these idols are these power figures that the people are drawing their hope from, their power from, when he sees all the deception that is permeating his society, when he sees the way that they are being deceived, that they are being diluted in their faith, as he sees these facts, these things around him, he's got to ask, Well, you draw your hope from these things. You draw your help from these statues, these idols. Where does my help come? And he goes, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. You have your statues to Baal. You have your Asher poles. I have the God who has created this universe. You have these things that are seen that you've made with your own hand. I have the one who is unseen who created everything. So when I look out at the facts and they don't look good, when they are bearing down on me, I will stand firm in the faith of the one who is unseen. And so this is what Moses is calling his people to. Do not be afraid. Stand firm firm in the faith of the one who is unseen, who is behind all and before all. Do not be afraid. Stand firm. Be still. Now, I love this phrase, be still. You know, probably the the most famous place it is mentioned is in Psalm 46 verse 10, where we read, God is speaking 
and he says, be still and know that I am God. And what I love about this psalm is this psalm isn't written in peacetime. God is not saying, you know, on your lunch break, when you're wandering out beside a quiet brook, just be still and know that I am God. This psalm is written in the midst of battle. And what it's saying here is that when the war is raging around you, when everything seems to be bearing down on you, be still and know that I am God. And what I love even more in this passage is that we under-translate this phrase, be still. I don't know if you're aware of that. That in the Hebrew, this phrase, be still, carries much greater intensity. That if we were to more accurately translate this phrase, be still, it would be, shut up! Shut up and know that I am God! Stop your whinging, stop your complaining, and know who I am. Shut up. And when I sit with my clients, I'll often have to say to them, no, I don't tell them to shut up. (laughs) I'll often have to say to them, you need to hold on to the truth. And you need to stand firm in the truth and say to your emotions, your mood, your mindset, to sit down and shut up. It has been waging war against you and we need it to settle down so that it stops rampaging in your mind. So don't be afraid. Stand firm. Be still. This is the faith perspective, people. Now, you would think that the faith perspective is the pinnacle, wouldn't you? that this is the top of where we need to get to. And Moses, I mean, Moses nails the faith perspective, doesn't he? But what's interesting is that God now speaks and God takes it to a whole new level. God introduces us to an overcomer's perspective. And what God says to Moses, he says, Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Why are you complaining to me? Now, if you were Moses, equally, you'd be thinking, um, this is pretty obvious. Red Sea, Pharaoh's army, ensuing massacre. You know, you are our God. You are our provider. You are our strength. Of course, we're going to cry out to you. Who else would we cry out to? But what God says to him is, Moses, tell the people to move forward. Lift up your staff, stretch out your hand, and divide the Red Sea so that the Israelites can walk across it on dry ground. Oh, says Moses, I forgot that one. I mean, what God is saying to us here, people, is that you have faith in God. That is excellent. But never lose sight of the fact that he has faith in you. He's saying to Moses, I have gifted you with power and authority to make something happen. So get the people to move. And he's saying to all of us, as my sons, I have gifted you with power and authority. So make something happen. Don't paint yourself powerless. Remember that you are sons of the Most High God. Make something happen. Now, it would be fair enough to ask, how do we do this? You know, when we've got the Red Sea on one side and things don't look good. Well, you see, in the Hebrew, that phrase to move forward is now sa, which simply means move forward forward in stages. In other words, one step at a time. The image here in the Hebrew is of someone lifting up, pulling up their tent pegs. You see, my friends, you may not know where you're going to end up. You may not even know how you're going to get there. 
But what God is saying to us here is do the very first thing that you can do. P lift up your tent pegs. Pack up your camp. Get ready to move. Do what you can do and leave to God what only He can do. And so what I'll find though is that so often people are busily waiting for God to move first. When He has placed His dream inside of you, its scriptures say that God is at work in you to will and to work for His good pleasure. There is something that He has placed in you that is stirs in you that you have to give expression to. We have to dream out what God has dreamed into us. But what I'll find is so often people are limiting what God is doing in their life. They are editing out what the Holy Spirit is trying to speak to them about. Because they will say, oh, but that's too big. That's too much. That's too grandiose. You know, I don't want to get proud. You know, I'm not sufficient for that. I'm inadequate. I'm disqualified for that. But do you know what I find? is that usually it's not that the dream is too big, but that your steps aren't small enough. We need to pull up our tent pegs to do the very thing that we can do and leave to our Lord what only He can do. That what we do is we take one step at a time because I'll find that people aren't even doing what they can do. They'll know, you know, with what I, I guess that God is placing on my heart, what's the next step that I need to do? You know, there's a conversation that I need to have. There, there's a step of faith that I need to take. But at that point, they'll shut themselves down and they'll go, but you know what? It wouldn't matter. It won't become anything. It won't achieve anything. It's all too big. That what they'll say is that, you know, I could go and I could talk to that person, but they won't listen. It won't matter. But it doesn't matter in many ways whether they listen or they don't. You need to do what you can do. And so often we get captivated by the issue in front of us, by the Red Sea that just seems so huge and insurmountable that we forget to move in faith with the power and the authority that He's given us doing what we can do and leaving to our God what only He can do. And you know, one of the things that I love in this passage is that Moses, as he lifts his staff and he stretches out his hand, you know, when you read the scripture, it's not like you see in the movies. The waters don't instantaneously part. As Moses stretches out his hand, throughout the night, the wind begins to build. Throughout the night, the waters begin to recede. It happens throughout the night. Moses has to commit himself with determination and perseverance to see the miracle take place. And the same is true with us that if we're gonna move forward in courage, we've gotta move forward in faith with determination and perseverance, doing what we can do, lifting up our tent pegs and leaving to our God what only He can do. See, my friends, what is it that God is, has been placing on your heart? What is the dream that he has been putting in you? How has he been stirring you? And in what ways have you limited that? That it's time to pull up your tent pegs and do what you can do. If we are to be people who are people of strength, who live with courage for our God, we've got to bring closure to our past so it stops pursuing us and undermining us. We have to have faith in the present, in the one who is unseen. And we need to take our steps of faith, stepping out and doing what we can do to dream out what God has dreamed into us.
Are you with me? My friends, can we just stand together, please? And just where you are right now, I want you to center yourself on the Lord. I want you to greet him and connect with him. I want you to listen. What is the Holy Spirit highlighting in your life? What needs to be addressed? If you're a person where you know that you need to bring closure to your past, that what you have done or failed to do, that the regret of that has been binding you up and disqualifying you, I want you to come find a place at the front as a step into God's presence to receive his healing. If you are a person where you know that things have been done to you, where you feel like there is a sense that this is who I am and you need to discover again that this was never the essence of you, that you still get to decide what you do with what has been handed to you from the past, that it's time to bring healing. I want you to come find a place at the front. If you're a person where you know that in the present of what you're facing, the facts don't look good, and you need greater faith to face that, come, find a place at the front. Because we're going to have people who are going to pray strength and courage into you. And if you know that God has been calling you to do something, there is, there is a step that you know you need to take, then what I'm going to get you to do is come at the front as you're now making a declaration. Lord, I may not even know where I'm going to end up, but I know that I want to go with you. And I don't want to limit what you're doing in my life. So I will do the very smallest thing that I can do so that you can do what only you can do. Come find a place at the front and we're going to have people gather around you and pray into you so that we have men who are healed and whole and carry strength and confidence in who they are in him and that they move courageously into this future so that we change this world for our God. We see more of his kingdom come. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your men here today, for these kids of yours that you delight in, that your heart bursts with love over, that you were willing to sacrifice your own son for these men because they mean that much to you. Father, we need your healing touch. Lord, we need you to bring closure to our past. We may still need to face the consequences of what has happened. We may still need to take responsibility for what has happened. But Lord, we no longer want it to define who we are. And Lord, may we have eyes to see you, the one who is unseen, and know who you are, that we stand firm in faith, regardless of what we see around us. And we dream out this future that you've dreamed into us, that we are change agents, that we are your men, your warriors, your protectors, your influences in this society for good, for you. Come, have your way, my Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, now. Holy Spirit, come and fill us all. Fill us with your presence. Fill us with your love. Fill us with your power. Fill us with your truth. Thank you, Lord.
Can we get the prayer team just to move through if you're not already doing so and laying hands and just praying into what God is doing? Men, as you're standing there as well at the back, if you can just lift a hand and pray into what God is doing with the men here. We need your support in this. We need your prayers. Mm, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. My friends, I just get a real sense this is a holy moment. That something's shifting now that's going to change people's lives. It's gonna change families, communities. And I just want us to, to thank our God for what he's doing. Because there's something quite holy and special that's taking place. And this is a beginning for many of you. This isn't the end. This is a new way of walking, a new way of thinking, a new way of growing. Mm. And for the men who are still in the seats, I've got a question for you that I wanna give you and then you're gonna move into some group time. I want you to imagine Jesus comes to you and he says, I know that you love me. Tell me, what do you want to do for me and my kingdom? You name it and I'll back you. If Jesus said that to you, what would you ask for? What would you want to do to see achieved if you knew you had his backing? Let's not limit what the Holy Spirit is saying to us, but let's open our understanding and our ears to what the Spirit is saying. Of course, we're going to test and weigh anything that stirs in us. But I want you to start to think, if Jesus said, what do you want to do for me and my kingdom? You name it and I'll back you. What would you ask for? So where you are in your seats, just gather in your groups right now. Turn to the other men around you, beside you. And start to answer that question, share for one 
to one another and then pray for each other and what God has placed in your life. And we're going to continue to pray and to minister to the men who are up here as well.